So yeah, 40 years ago today, on a Sunday morning, I actually it was Sunday night, I was saved, opened my heart up to Jesus, and, and since that time, it's been 40 years that I have been serving Jesus with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and I'm here to tell you this morning, it is the ultimate journey. I mean, it's just awesome. And so I, I just thought today, just kind of celebrate, take some time and share a little bit of the journey that I've been on, and, and my hope is that maybe some parts of it would jump out at you and be an encouragement to you, be a blessing. And uh, it's probably going to go just a hair long this morning, so, you know, hang in there with me. It's just sort of a birthday service or something like that, you know, spiritual birthday. This is really, I just can't hardly believe God saved me and been saved 40 years. It just is amazing. But um, when I say serving the Lord, I mean me, I think of it, I mean totally, radically, 100% on fire, no hold back, all the way, serving Jesus. That's what I think of. Because for me, that's what it's been, and partly because that's when I got saved, that's what the people told me it was about. It wasn't just like praying a prayer, it was like, no man, are you in or aren't you? And I thought, yeah, I'm in, I want to do this. So uh, it's been 40 years of really exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people forget the fact that everybody wasn't always a Christian. I think sometimes even they, you know, look at a pastor and think, well, maybe he's always been a Christian or something. I was not always a Christian. Uh, I grew up in a great, great home, uh, had a loving mother and father, had, had 11 brothers and sisters, and had a, had a great family life. I mean, my mom and dad were awesome people. I, I never, think about this, I never saw my mom and dad argue, ever, not one time. Never saw my dad drunk. Uh, never saw him smoking or cursing. I mean, these were really, really great people. My dad was always around. Uh, when we were younger, he used to tell us stories, kind of imprinted in me this whole thing of I love telling stories. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I don't think she had much of a choice, 12 children. You know, <laughs> kept her plenty busy. But uh, when I was 18, I moved out of the house and started attending college, and uh, it was called Glassboro State at that time, and really that's when my life really started to take a downhill turn. Uh, I had started in high school rebelling as a teenager, uh, but actually at that time really pretty strong and heavy into drugs and alcohol. So when I finished my first year of college, I just was really confused in my mind and just searching, didn't really know what I was looking for, but I decided that I would hitchhike across the country thought that would be a good way to figure out life. And really at that time, there were literally thousands of young people hitchhiking across the country all over the place. Uh, we were referred to as hippies, long hair, bearded, uh, you know, dropout kind of people. But really there were lots of us on the road, literally thousands of people hitchhiking around the country. So I convinced one of my friends, let's, let's, hitchhike, let's hitchhike around the country. And he didn't have any money, I didn't have any money. We rousted up 60 bucks and said, let's go. So. <laughs> we started right outside New York City, that's where I grew up, and uh, we headed west. Thought, man, let's just take the summer and discover the country. And so we started hitchhiking all over the country. Uh, several months later, we end up in San Francisco, completely broke and hungry. And so we went to what was referred to at that time, the Haight-Ashbury District. Some of you might be familiar with that, but that was where all the hippies and that was the happening scene. So we go there, and when you show up in town, everybody tells you, go to the Haight-Ashbury. Uh, they'll help you find a place to stay, and they call them crash pads. So you go there, and they'll find a crash pad for you, and it was free. So we show up, say, hey, you know, what do you got? And they look on this board, and he goes, everything's filled. Oh, wait, he goes, no, there's this, he goes, there's a Jesus freak house open, man. They put people up, and they're just totally weird, but it's the last house. <laughs> and so my friend and I said, well, we got no place to stay. Let's go. So we, we go over to the uh, Jesus Freak crash pad. It was a Christian commune, and we stayed the first night. But when we stayed the second night, uh, one of the guys running the house kind of cornered me and started talking to me about God. And, uh, you know, I, I don't remember all that he said, but I do remember the point where he began to share with me out of the Word of God and it, the one scripture that just jumped out at me totally transformed my life, and it was the passage found in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn to it. We have it up on the screen here. But the passage is uh, Jesus speaking to the church, and so he says to the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This was Jesus speaking to the church, in other words, Christians, but apparently he wasn't in their lives. And when he's referring to the door, he's talking about the door of their heart. And the guy started telling me, look, man, he said, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. 
And I remember to this day, he was. I mean, I could hear him knocking. I mean, it was pounding. My heart was pounding. And he said, you want to open that door? And, you know, I was freaking out, man. I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't know. And uh, he said, all you have to do is pray a simple prayer. Just, you know, bow your head with me and pray. And I'm sitting here, and this battle was going on in my mind that I think still to this day goes on in people's minds when they're making that decision. You know, when we're at church here on Sunday and end of the service, I give people an opportunity to make a decision. I believe there's warfare going on in our hearts and our minds. And that day, I heard voices say to me, don't do this, don't do this. Get out of here. These people are weird. And then I hear another voice saying, look, man, this is what you've been searching for all your life. Go for it. And I made the decision. I said, all right, I'll pray. I bowed my head, prayed a very simple prayer. Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And I'm telling you, at that moment, I was saved. My, my life was transformed. Something radically happened to me. It, it, it was the first time that I understood what that hunger was inside my heart that had been there for so long and this thought of searching. I didn't really know what I was searching for, but at that moment I realized my hunger was for God. And I think all of us have that hunger. We, sometimes people refer to it as a God-shaped hole in your heart. You cannot fill it with anything else, but until you have this encounter with God, that, that hunger never gets met. But that, that night... That hunger was met. Jesus came into my life, and I was transformed. So, uh, you know, Shiloh was a, a sort of a radical place. It was part of what we called a, a Christian hippie communes, and uh, they, they were all over the United States. At that time, there were about 40 Shiloh houses around the country, and when you got saved, what they would say is, hey, you want to join up with us? So I said, sure, I'll join up. What do I have to do? They said, just move in, man. So I moved in. But of course, I was with my friend. So I said to him, hey, you know what? I'm going to stay here in San Francisco. I'm joining this Christian commune. He could not believe it. He said, you becoming a Jesus freak? I said, I guess so, man. I'm, I'm staying, man. I'm, I got God, and I'm in. So we parted ways. And immediately, uh, they told me the most important thing is start reading the Bible. And they said, start in the New Testament. So, man... I opened it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading, I mean, I just devoured this book, and, and it really began to speak to me, but one of the first experiences I had with the Word of God, as I was reading, I went through the Gospels, I got into the epistles, and I started noticing that Paul, when he would introduce his epistles, he would say, to the saints at Rome, then he'd say, to the saints in Corinth. And then when I got to the epistle of uh, uh, Ephesians, it said, to the saints in Ephesus, and it just kind of, it affected me. It dramatically affected me. Something jumped out of there, and it was partly because of my upbringing. I, I had grown up a Catholic, a devout Catholic, and I had never, ever heard the gospel preached to me before as far as being born again. I, I grew up believing what I call the foundational uh, Christian truths. I believed in God. I believed that Jesus was the Son of God. I knew there was a heaven. I knew there was a hell. Uh, I knew that Jesus died on the cross, but I also was taught a lot of other things that weren't really biblical basis. I was taught to pray the rosary, and, and I did pray that fervently right up until the day I was saved. I also was taught that if you're good, you go to heaven. If, you, if you're good enough, God will let you in, and uh, I attended church every Sunday of my life. Actually, the first uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, I had to go to church every day during the week because our school was a Catholic school, but on Sunday, I never missed church, partly because they said I would go to hell if I did, so that kind of helps a little motivation, you know, but I didn't want to go to hell, but uh, I really, even to this day, I think I've only missed church three or four times my entire life, uh, but, but, you know, I, I thought I was a Christian. I remember the opening part of that conversation, the person asking me, am I a Christian? I said, well, sure, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. I go to church, and, and aren't all Catholics Christians? And uh, yet, you know, in my heart, and I think if you're honest with yourself, you realize I, I, I was a flat-out hypocrite. I mean, I knew it. I knew I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. And, you know, even to this day when I'm talking to people and they say, uh, well, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. I try to tell them, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was one of those for many, many years. You know, I would go to church on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, man, I lived my own life. I did my own thing, and, and it had started really, the rebellious part actually started in high school. I just really began running with the wrong crowd, and, uh, you know, I never denied my belief in God, but, but 
sin began to take a greater hold of my life. Every year, more and more, and darker and darker, and it was a powerful force in my life. So uh, attending Catholic school, I had been told, because the Catholics teach about sainthood, I had been told that the only way you become a saint is you have to, it has to be after you're dead, and then certain verified miracles have to be done in your name, and then somebody uh, puts your name up for canonization, and then a board reviews it, and it's years and years, and then eventually the Pope signs off and you become a saint. That's how it's done in the Catholic Church, and that's how I was taught. And even when I was in fifth grade, I, I spent a lot of time in the library after school waiting for a ride home, and I just got into reading these books about sainthood. I, I don't know, it just must have been God, but I, I couldn't stop reading them. I read 50 books in one school year about saints, every one of them about men and women who had lived their lives dedicated to God. All of them martyred and canonized and became saints. And I remember how it affected me, and I started thinking, man, you know, wh wow, who were these people? And how awesome it was that they had dedicated their lives to God. And then I'm reading the Bible and I read Paul says to the saints in Rome and to the saints in Corinth and to the saints in Ephesus and it dawned on me, whoa, these people were still alive when he wrote that letter. I started thinking, well, what, what does saint mean? So uh, I looked up in a concordance, the very first time I used a concordance, I looked up the word saint. Said, what is this? Saint means set apart, separated from sin, someone who's dedicated to God. I realized, that's the first time I realized that, that when I opened my heart to Jesus and asked him to forgive me of my sins, I became a legitimate saint. I did. Saint David. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's biblical, man. That is really, you know what? To the saints in Vineyard Community Church, you are alive. Have you, have you had your life changed by Christ? Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you been separated unto God? If so, you are a saint now. I mean, you, could, you know what? You can start calling me Saint Dave if you want <laughs> instead of Pastor Dave. That's, I just like Saint Dave. It's just Saint Dave. I try to tell Roxana that, but she just doesn't, I don't know, it just doesn't connect, you know? The kids haven't caught on to that one. They just think it's like egotistical, you know? But, but it isn't really. You're a saint. And I mean, it was it really, it's the first what I call epiphany. I had an epiphany when it dawned on me, oh my gosh, God has saved me, and sainthood is not reserved for the select few who are perfect. Sainthood is for all those who come into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, through their sins being forgiven. You become a saint. So, uh, you know, when I joined the Shiloh ministry, I told my friend I was staying, and uh, then I started writing letters home to my brothers and sisters, and... Wow, that didn't go over too well. You know, sometimes when you first get saved, there's a lot of zeal and not a lot of wisdom. And so all my letters tell them, you're all going to hell. You need to repent of your sins. The Catholic Church is not good and you need to get out of there. And, you know, wow, that just <laughs> it wasn't a lot. Bless God, my family loved me. And they even sent my older brother Henry out and my sister Elizabeth to check me out and see if I had joined a cult. You know, like, what in the world happened, man? And I said, no, I, I'm quit college. I'm done with that. I'm going to serve Jesus. I, I'm going to serve Jesus the rest of my life. And I, I, I'm just so grateful that even through all the radical and craziness, somehow God was able to reach my family, my brothers and sisters, even my mom and dad. And eventually my entire family came into the kingdom of God and was born again. So uh, even several of my uh, siblings joined me in the Shiloh ministry for a number of years. So it was really a great run. And the Shiloh ministry was a, a youth ministry, again, part of what people often refer to as the Jesus people movement that was sweeping through the country. Literally thousands and thousands of teens were joining up. The Shiloh ministry had thousands of young people in it. And they were really uh, Christian communes. I mean, that's just, you know, we thought that was the way you're supposed to live. So we lived in a Christian commune and everything was shared. We owned nothing. You know, it was really communal living. And, uh, you know, we, even when we worked, we tried to work together, you know, in groups whenever we could. And all of our money, uh, whenever we got money, we put it in a communal pot. And the guy who was in charge of the house, the pastor of the house, he would pay the rent, buy the food, whatever needs. And then they would send the rest of it up to uh, Oregon where the uh, ministry headquarters were, and that money was to be used to pay for the Shiloh Bible School, and also they were using that to plant new Shiloh houses. Every, every couple, six months or so, they were sending out teams to start new houses. So 
uh, it was tremendous experience and, and, you know, the spiritual maturity obviously was not there, but we thought we were pretty mature because after you were saved a month, 30 days, you got to start giving Bible studies. Is that awesome? I gave my first Bible study 30 days after I was born again, and it was really deep. <laughs> a lot of things like, wow, heavy, cool, dig this, you know, great Bible studies, but I, I kind of hope I've progressed, you know, over the years. That it's not just, wow, cool, dig this, but it did something to me, and I began to love the Word of God and have been reading this book for 40 years and studying it and making it a part of my life, and it just awakened something in me about telling people what the Word of God says and teaching people what the Word of God says. While we lived in San Francisco, uh, while I lived there, uh, the first job I got was uh, a bicycle messenger, and a bunch of us worked together, and we would deliver packages all over the city, and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, every night, we'd get home, and since it was registered as a crash pad, we would get somewhere between 50 and 100 hitchhikers every single night, all of them young teens, you know, and they're somewhere between 16, 18, and 25 every night. And so every night we'd feed them, put them up for a place to stay, and every night we'd have a Bible study. Every night we'd witness to people, and every night people would get saved. It was just an amazing time every single day. This went on for about a year and uh, learned, learned tremendous, tremendous lessons uh, in my early days. One of, the first, uh, one of the first scriptures that really, really challenged me, it was right in the Gospel of Matthew as I was reading and it jumped out at me. I thought maybe I'd mention this one to you. It's in Matthew 21. And it's a passage where uh, Jesus was challenging the Jewish people because they were not responding to him. And let me just uh, turn to it here. Matthew 21, verse 44. Jesus said, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And then everybody has different scriptures that open up to you. But when I read this one, I sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And he basically said, look, Dave, you have two choices in life. And both of them are going to lead to brokenness. So here's your choice. Either I fall on you and crush you to powder. Or you fall on me and let me break you. But either way, you're going to be broken. I mean, he clearly spoke to me. And I read this and thought, wow, man, that's my choice. Either I fall on him, let him break me, or he falls on me and crushes the daylights out of me. And I made a decision that day, I'm going to fall on Jesus, let him break me from my own rebelliousness, my willfulness, my life. Because he teaches us all the way through the Gospels. At some point in your walk with Jesus, I believe he calls you to a place where you say, are you in or aren't you? And it's not just are you in, but are you in 100%. Is it all the way? And it really, really spoke to me. And I decided that day that I was in and that I was going to let Jesus break the junk out of my life, the sin, the rebellion, the attitudes, so that he could make me the person he created me to be. And I've since that time continued to dedicate my life to Christ. And I'm so grateful that he will gently break each of us if we allow him. But you cannot resist the kingdom of God. At some point... He's going to break you, or, or he's going to crush you, but either way, you have to decide who's going to be in charge of your life. And I decided I'd let Jesus be the king and let him break me. After I finished that first year at San Francisco, they asked me if I wanted to attend Bible school. It was up in Eugene. I said, yeah. So I headed up there and spent some time at this Bible school. But our Bible school was so different than what I see in most seminaries and Bible schools today. Ours was so simple. Guess what we did at our Bible school? We studied the Bible. <laughs> really amazing. But, you know, I kind of wonder about a lot of seminaries and Bible schools today. Like, they study everything but the Bible. Uh, we, didn't even, we didn't care about the Hebrew or the Greek. We just went from Genesis to Revelation, read every single bit of it, talked about it, discussed it, prayed about it, and truly, truly was a great experience. When I finished the Bible school, they were sending out teams. Only this time they said, hey, would you be interested in being on a traveling evangelistic team? 
I asked them, what does that mean? They, at the beginning, they started out with about 30 of us. They said, we're going to send you to the shallow houses all over the country, and we want you guys to just kind of be an encouragement to them and help them in reaching out to the people on the streets, go out in the parks and the streets and pass out tracts, witness to people, and uh, that will be your ministry. I said, man, that sounds awesome. So then he said, well, here's the deal. You have to pay for it yourself. Yeah, okay. So back then, we didn't send out letters and ask people to support us. I don't know how that's developed over the years, but back then, if you were going to do a ministry, we worked for it. So they said, look, we'll help you get jobs. You work for a couple of months, and you save up all your money, and then you use that, and you go do these trips. And so we'd work two or three or four months, save up all our money, and then we'd go on trips for one or two or three months, travel all over the United States, did all kinds of crazy jobs. The one that we ended up doing the most was tree planting up in the Cascades, up in Eugene. We also planted down in the Smoky Mountains, down in uh, Oklahoma. But it was hard work. I mean, really, really hard work, but they would pay us tremendous amount of money. So we would get whole teams together. We'd plant trees. And uh, it was during that time that I noticed this girl that was on the team because it was guys and girls, and her name was Roxana. And I was thinking, wow, she plants trees really fast. And <laughs> No, I was faster than her. <laughs> I thought she was like really cool, you know, I was like, whoa, this girl's cool, she was so sold out to Jesus, and, and uh, you know, we started hanging out, and, and then, then in those days, the shallow ministry had some really strict rules, like if you wanted to date somebody, you had to kind of talk about it with the people who were like over the house, and you said, well, I'd like to start dating her, and the rules were we could never date by ourselves, we had to have chaperones. Somebody had to be with us, always had to be three or four with us, always, that was the rule. And it was just, you know, back then, man, it was so, you know, you just hated it. I look back on it now, I'm so thankful. Kept our relationship pure and healthy and uh, really, really helped us. It wouldn't be bad if people had chaperones to this day, but uh, it was part of the shallow ministry, all sorts of rules and regulations, but it was great. It was really a great experience and really helped me. So we started traveling, and oh my gosh, we did every kind of crazy outreach you could ever imagine. It kind of prepared me for when I was going to be here pastoring, but we did. We walked the streets, stop people, give them tracks, tell them they need to be born again. You know, total strangers and just, you know flip them right out. And, but, you know, sometimes there'd be these God encounters. I mean, we'd pray for people. They'd get saved. We started doing skits in the parks, and uh, then we built a puppet stage. We started doing Christian puppet shows, and then eventually I got into doing pantomime. I don't know how I got into it. I just kind of got started doing it, but I was doing all these mime shows, and man, we would, when we were in the park, we'd gather two, three, four hundred people at a time, and they'd either be the show would be Christian, or when it was over, we would just tell them, hey, you know, we're here to talk to you about Jesus. If you want to get more information, come up, and every time, two or three or four or five would come up, we'd talk to them and pray, but I just had a lot of fun, and, and literally during those years, saw hundreds and hundreds of young people get saved, and it was just tremendous experience. And some of those people we've been able to even stay in touch with, and even some of them actually went into the ministry. Eventually, uh, Roxanne and I got married, but in the shallow ministry, you get married, you can't live in these communal houses. That was the rule. You had to move out, and so we had to move out, and we decided to stay right there in Eugene. There was a shallow church that had started. Other couples had gotten married. They moved out, and we thought, Let, you know, let's, let's stay here and see what God has for us. And uh, really, it was during that time that my call to pastoring was really confirmed in my heart. You know, as a young child, I, 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 I truly believe God called me to pastor, but because I was uh, in the Catholic Church, I only thought that meant I'm supposed to be a priest. And yet I had this yearning. I wanted to serve God, and, and you know, I, I would even have meetings with the priests when I was in, like, junior high, and say, you know, what does this entail? I, I want to serve God. And I just never could make the connection. You know, I just thought, man, I really want to serve God. And by the time I hit high school, it was like, man, nah, that, that was over. And I gave up on that desire to serve God. But when I got saved, it was like that fire was rekindled. I started realizing, yes, yes, this is what I want to do. And that first year, Roxanne and I were married. We were in this shallow church. And they said, hey, would you guys like to start a home group? And we had never been a part of a home group. We were only in the communal houses. You know, what does this mean? Well, you have a Bible study in your home, and you reach out to your friends and neighbors, invite them. And, 
and see what happens. So they said, look, here's a young couple that just got saved in our church. Why don't the two of you meet together first and see what happens? So we met together, and then we started talking to our friends who talked to our friends, and a real Holy Ghost revival broke out. Within about four or five months, 50-something people were coming into our house, almost all of them brand-new Christians, and we were just having a blast. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And then I decided during that time, man, I, I was still tree planting and I was getting so burnt out on that. I'm telling you, that is just rough work. You get your muddy and your thorn bushes and up in the mountains. And I decided, I don't think I want to do this the rest of my life. So I thought I'd maybe go back to college. So I went back to college, finished my second year at, at uh, community college. And since we were in Eugene, I was going to transfer to Eugene, uh, uh, Oregon University. So I drive, drive to the campus. I get out of my car, I'm walking to the administration office, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me, clear as I've ever heard him speak to me in my entire life, and said, don't want you signing up. And I just stopped right at my tracks, like, did I just hear that? And I heard again, do not go to the admissions office. I want you to get ready. I'm going to send you out to pastor a church. Like, clearly spoke to me, and I'm standing there thinking, wow, I have all my paperwork, I'm ready to transfer. I just turned around, got back in my car, drove home, told Roxanne. I said, Roxanne, God spoke to me today. She said, what? I said, he told me I can't register for my third year. We're going to get sent out. She said, did he say where? She said, like, <laughs> say Hawaii? I said, no. She said, better not be some foreign country. <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't have running water. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just know he spoke to me. Let's see what happens. And just like two weeks later, pastor of the church calls me up that we were going to a shallow church. Say, we need to get together and talk. So we get together. He says, you know, we'd like to send you out a plant, to plant a church in Columbus, Ohio. We said, well, what's up? He said, well, there's a couple of married couples just got married. They're moving out of the shallow house. There's two shallow houses there. We'd like to start a community church. Would you guys be interested? We said, oh, yeah. Felt like God had already prepared us, and we, we, we were committed to do it, and so they sent us out. And, uh, you know, we, we drove cross-country and decided, okay, we got with our group here, said, hey, we're going to start a church, and everybody was pretty excited, and we were only here a couple of months. Then I get a phone call from Eugene, Oregon. They say, hey, Dave, uh, some conflict going on in the shallow ministry. The leaders are not getting along, so you know what? We're going to disband, and uh, you're on your own. Have a nice day. Love you. I'm thinking, what? Well, what are we supposed to do? He said, well, you can incorporate and become an independent church, or you can just close down. And right, you know, we had this meeting, and we told the Shiloh people, look, it's over. Shiloh ministry is disbanding. And so the two Shiloh houses said, well, we're disbanding. They closed right down, and the, uh, there was about 30 people that were, like, in the community that were starting to come. And the ones that were part of Shiloh said, we're just going to move away, go back to where we came from. And so we were left with about 15 people. Like, great, man. That was my first four months of pastoring. I went from like 40 to 60 people on Sunday morning down to 15. That is how you build a church, you know, just the wrong way. Um, but, but we felt God sent us, and we said, look, let's, let's give it our all. And so we contacted Calvary Chapel at that time. Calvary Chapel is located out of uh, California. They're all over the U.S. now. But Calvary Chapel was pastored and still is pastored by Chuck Smith, but it was the uh, birthplace of the Shiloh ministry. The Shiloh ministry birthed out of Calvary Chapel, and they sort of kind of supervised and helped keep things in order. But when it disbanded, we just called Calvary, I called, talked to Chuck, said, Chuck, can, can we become a Calvary? Yeah, yeah. He said, sure, you're a Calvary. And that's, what it, that's how we became a Calvary, just like that. No, no, you know, no paperwork, no meetings. So in 1978, October of 1978, it's what we celebrate our church anniversary. We became officially incorporated as Faith Chapel, at that time, I was 24 years old, newly married, and had no idea how to pastor a church. Zero. I mean, all I knew was communal living, and all I knew was like street ministry, and so uh, it was really, really a challenge, sort of learn as you go. But we kind of committed, Roxanne and I said, well, look, let's give it a year, and we'll just work our hardest, and if God blesses it and people get saved and we go from 15 and we see some growth, man, let's, let's stick it out. We, we felt he sent us here and we really wanted to give it a try. So we worked really hard that first year reaching out, uh, witnessing and sharing with neighbors and friends, and the church actually started to grow. Young people started to get saved. And actually, uh, two of our people that are original, almost like original members, are still with us to this day. I know Mike's back here, Mike Roshan. Just raise your hand. Mike, Mike's been with us the whole time, man. 
And Tom, where's Tom? Right here. Tom's been with us the whole time. Tom Cooper, right here. Tom? You guys get special rewards in heaven. I'm just telling you, for being with me all these years, man, oh, man. But you know, what a blessing to have guys that have been with us all that time. And it really, we got to see, you know, God was saving people. And, and even during that first year, that second year, my family, uh, some of my family started moving to Columbus, said they'd like to help us work with the church. And so a couple of my sisters moved down. And then eventually my entire family basically moved down. My mom and dad moved down and brought some of the younger brothers and sisters. And at one time... Uh, I had uh, 10 of my brothers and sisters plus my mom and dad that were helping us with the church and uh, really, really, really was a great blessing. I mean, I know God birthed the church, but I can tell you there's nothing like when you have family supporting you. I mean, it's just, there's something there. And uh, to this day, I mean, they've, many of them have moved on, but to this day, two of my brothers are still here. Henry's still here. Henry, right here. Raise your hand, Henry. Is Phil here this morning? My brother Phil here? Can't tell. Where are you at? All the way in the back, Phil's still here, so... Love you guys, man, you know. Just been a tremendous blessing here. Uh, but, you know, we enjoyed the church. It was starting to grow with a little church, and we were watching God bring people in. And at that time, my family was starting to grow. Roxanne and I started having children, and uh, we eventually had six children. We've raised them all here at the church, and I just want to say I'm so blessed. I mean, really, really have got great children. And I think, you know, growing up in a pastor's home, you get special credit. You know what I'm saying? You know, the PK kids always get harassed and challenged, but I've uh, been really blessed and so proud of my family. So anyway, we started renting this home over there. Uh, it's, it's not there anymore, but it's on the corner of Palmer and Taylor. There's a Kroger's there now, and it was a little farmhouse, and we started renting that, and then we kind of outgrew. We're just using a little side room. We outgrew that. We moved down the road to where Cotner's Funeral Home is. Some of you might know where that is, just a little down the road on Main Street. They had this side building. They've got a number of buildings there, but one building they had where they were storing their uh, caskets and their tombs stones there and so uh, they said they would rent that to us and we thought that was good enough size we could fit maybe 60 people in there at the time we were about 30 or 40 maybe 50 and so uh, we rented it but they couldn't get the tombstones out before our first service so we were a little freaked out about this but we came up with a really cool idea we put little signs on all the tombstones and they said like first one said the dead in Christ shall rise first and the other one said, the wages of sin is death. And the other one said, uh, uh, death has lost its sting. And they were all around the side of the wall. We had our first service. It was kind of an interesting service, but we got through that. Eventually, we outgrew that building, and we bought the property that we're on right now on Palmer Road. And, and we started building the church, a little section in the front there. It was all volunteer labor. Uh, I call it the 100 Saturdays. We came out for 100 consecutive Saturdays and basically built the building. And we paid cash as we went, uh, just kind of moved along slowly, but just did all the labor ourselves. It was great, great, uh, you know, great experience. During that time, we were renting uh, Hannah Ashton Middle School and building this. It took us, like I said, two years. And then in uh, 1987, we finally got it finished. We had this really great celebration. And uh, right after we got it finished, we had just paved a little section of the driveway on the side. And within a couple of months, we started noticing skateboarders showing up. And they're skateboarding in all over the parking lot and thinking, man, you know, let's, let's reach out to them. So uh, we got a bunch of guys together and built this huge half-pipe ramp, uh, ramp and then a metal ramp and then a bunch of smaller ramps. And every day, we'd have them out in the parking lot. And these kids were skateboarding all over the place. Then we started having skateboard outreaches. And the newspaper picked up on it, and the front page one day said, a lot of holy rolling going on at this church, you know. And it was, these kids were pretty wild, and uh, we did all kinds of outreaches, you know. Uh, did the skateboard outreach, we did a oil, free oil change outreach, we did huge vacation Bible schools, I mean massive vacation Bible schools, biker Sunday motorcycle Sundays, marched in parades, I mean all kinds of stuff. We even did a Sunday afternoon, what we called it a sanctuary service for about two or three years, and had several hundred young people coming, and it was like heavy metal Christian music. I think Radio U plays that to this day, but it was like really driving hard uh, metal. But man, we saw kids saved all the time. It was really powerful. And then the one big outreach that we're probably most known for, which we did for 10 years, was our Hell Stop outreach. Some of you probably were still here, were probably part of that. But, uh, you know, even to this day, when I meet people and they're asking about the church, I tell them, yeah, we're over on Palmer and Taylor. And then they kind of look at you and they go, 
Is that the church? Yes, that's the church. We used to do the hell, you know. Anyway, did you used to do this Halloween? Yes, we used to do this Halloween thing. Uh, but it was an outreach that we did for 10 years, and it just grew and grew and grew, and it was an incredible outreach. And over that 10-year period, we, we pretty sure we reached over 50,000 people that went through that program. And uh, oh, I, I don't have the totals, but I can tell you thousands, plural, thousands of people were saved through that program. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, many of them were baptized right here in this building right those same nights. We just got into saying, well, if you're really serious, first we'd say, if you're really serious, just kneel down with us right here in, in the tent, you know, and they'd kneel down and be crying. And then we'd say, well, if you're really serious, you know, because we were thinking we were scaring them into salvation. If you're really serious, let's go get baptized. Okay, let's get baptized. And so it was just a tremendous, tremendous uh, outreach. Did for 10 years and God's hand was all over it. Uh, but eventually, uh, toward the late 80s, we got notice now that the Calvary Chapel movement was going through some division, and there was a group uh, that was going to branch out out of the Calvary Chapel movement called the Vineyard Churches, and it was being headed up, it was headed up by John Wimber. It was an amicable uh, separation. They weren't like arguing. They just felt like they wanted to branch out, and so we got notified. They said, well, you're a Calvary Chapel. You have to decide, are you going to go with Vineyard, or are you going to go with Calvary Chapel? And and at that time, we were still sort of, you know, remembering the struggle Shiloh had. And we thought, man, if we join up, one of these, they're going to have their struggle. They're going to have their struggle. Let's just go independent. And so we just sent them letters, said, we'll just go independent. But really, I look back on that, and I think, man, that, that was a mistake. I really, I really should have either stayed with Calvary or joined the vineyard. And, and truthfully, we were more vineyard at that time anyway. The way we run our church, the way we worship, the way we do ministry was vineyard style. We had met John Wimber in the Calvary movement, and uh, John really influenced me and uh, spoke into my life. And so we should have joined the vineyard, but at that time we didn't. Spent about eight or ten years being independent. And I can tell you, independent church is just not the way to go. I never liked it. Always felt like we were odd man out. There wasn't any accountability. And so we started in the year 2000 to work our way back to the vineyard. And then we officially incorporated, became a vineyard in 2005. And we have been so blessed. I mean, the Vineyard, the vineyard Association of Churches is an awesome association. I mean, really, you go any place in the country, vineyard churches, moving in the Holy Spirit, caring for the broken, the hurt, the lost, staying true to the Word of God. Uh, been a great blessing to our church. We got we have probably 40 vineyard churches in the central Ohio area. They helped us birth our medical clinic, uh, the legal clinic. Um, they, they really have been a blessing. And, and, and a number of people actually have joined our church as a result of being part of the vineyard. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a great experience, and I'm happy that we're part of an association because I think it keeps us a little more accountable and uh, part of something bigger than ourselves. You get this worldwide mission work and churches being planted all over the country and all over the world through the Vineyard Association, Bible school and stuff like that. So, and winding it down here, so what, what have I learned in 40 years? 40 years of reading the same book. I mean, you think about that, the same book. It's got to be something special to keep reading it year after year and it is the book is alive and and not only that but the holy spirit works through it and so you know in 40 years uh, god has spoken so many things into my life and i really felt like last year uh just as the year was winding up i really felt like the holy spirit was telling me he wanted me to start some new stuff in my life and uh, one of the first things he told me was when the new year came starting january i couldn't watch tv anymore zero like no Netflix no nothing you know like wow I mean where there are some exceptions I can watch some football in the fall he did say I can watch Ohio, <laughs> Ohio State games only no NFL no <laughs> but but I just felt the Holy Spirit said look you're wasting your time watching TV I have something better for you and then he said to me I want you to start writing books and I was thinking, man, you know, like a lot of you here, I'm sure many of you here have had this thought, like, I'd like to write a book. How many of you ever thought you'd like to write a book? I mean, really? Ever thought, I'd like to write a book sometime. Yeah, there's a good 30, 40, 50 of you. But, you know, that's a daunting task. Like, man, how can I afford that? I actually did write one book many, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It's called God Has Tattoos. It cost me like $4,000. I couldn't get a publisher to publish it, so you self-publish. You pay for everything. You have to do all the editing, the formatting. It took forever. It totally burnt me out, and I, I started thinking, I, I can't do that. It's just too much. Unless you happen to have a publisher step in who pays for it, it just becomes overwhelming. But I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, no, starting January, I want you to start writing books. 
And then right around January, December, January, I was on Amazon. I happened to look down the bottom. It said, publish with us. And I clicked on that, and I came across a website that really, really opened up to me about publishing books. So since January, I have a new adventure that God has got me on, and that is writing books. And so since January, I've I, books or I'm just going to say books or booklets. So since January, I've written six books since January, like I got addicted, I couldn't stop. So just for fun, if you have your smartphone, I want you to take a look what's happened and I can help any of you if you want to write a book, I can really help you. First of all, it's free. This is free. Go to Amazon, op open your smartphone. If you have your own uh, data package, use that because our Wi-Fi can't handle it. But if you have it, go to Amazon and uh, Amazon.com and then just type my name in. Type in David and then my last name, Diani. No space between a D and the I and the Y. All one word. Just type in David Diani. Look what will come up. Seven books are there available. Amazon will publish books for you for free. They don't charge anything and actually they're available on Kindle. You can get them on Kindle. You can get them, uh, you know, mail to you. You can buy them direct. The way they do it is they print on demand. Uh, they charge zero to do this. I mean, it's free. Uh, if you want to do editing, you have to do your own editing. But all you do is you have a Word document, drop it in. That thing goes, uh, just formats it right for you. And so I, I've got six books that I've written since January. And I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of on like a, I just feel driven. I just feel like the Holy Spirit said, write as many of these as you can, and he'll just inspire me. This is stuff that's lessons I've learned about the character, the nature of God, things that have changed my life, passages of scriptures that have opened up to me and have become life scriptures, lessons on, on finances, lessons on healthy living, lessons on the movement of the Holy Spirit, just so many. So I've done them in little booklet form, and if you're on the website, you can see them, but I'll just show you a couple of them. This one is called Turning the Other Cheek and Civil Disobedience. This is just something many years ago God spoke to me. I think every parent, especially of boys, ought to read this. I think Christians are so confused about self-defense and civil disobedience and things like that. This will really help you uh, get a biblical perspective on how you're supposed to handle yourself. And then there's another one here. This is called What's Your Sign? Uh, this one is about dreams. You know, the fact that God is still speaking through dreams, uh, prophecy, uh, things like astrology and things like that. Just some stuff that God's shown me over the years. So, uh, you know, that one. This one's called Another Way. I, I did, uh, this is just passages of scripture that I was taught one way as a young Christian. But over the years, they opened up to me a different way and totally changed my life. I mean, really, really uh, gave me a better perspective. So there's just certain passages of scriptures that I look at a different way and just I think it'll really help you. I, I think this is my favorite one. This is called God's Stories. At the bottom, underneath says, everyone needs an E320 experience. E320 is for Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. That says, thanks be to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And so there's stories in here where God E320'd me, and it's an encouragement for you to look out for E320s in your life. It's actually a small group thing you can do. It's got discussions. And then this one, I don't know, I just did this one. Uh, this is sort of what I've told all of you to do. This is, a, I call it my spiritual diary. I just, whenever God does a significant work in my life, I just record it. Sometimes it's just a sentence, and then later on I add to it, add to it, over a period of time, maybe a couple of paragraphs. But this is probably 30 or 40, just one or two paragraph stories, of just significant event, events that God has done in my life that I know he's doing in your life, and it just helps you realize, oh yeah, God is alive and truly working. What happens if you don't write these down, you forget them. And then you see other people, God's moving in their life, and you think, man, God doesn't ever move in my life. He is, if you've dedicated your life to him, he is. There's, other couple, there's two more I redid, the Goddess Tattoos book, and then I have another one called Advice to New Pastors. So you can buy them online, uh, but then you have to pay shipping and handling. So we've got them here in the cafe after the service. If you want to buy one, that would be great. They're like eight bucks. And um, if you would do me a favor, when you go to Amazon... 
If you could just write some reviews, you know, that kind of helps people. So they say, oh yeah, that might be a good book to get. That'll help get the word out. And then also on Facebook, I posted these on Facebook so you could see them. If you go to your Facebook, go to my Facebook. If you're not a friend, you have to befriend me, request that. I'll say yes. But then you can get into my page and the bottom left-hand side, all the books are listed and you can just click on them. It has a summary of each book. And again, if you like them, that puts it on your page and, you know, kind of gets the ball rolling, just trying to get the word out there. And then one other thing that God's really been inspiring me to do is to continue doing what I'm calling a weekly blog. I don't know if any of you have been able to tap into it, but every Monday, uh, if you go to our website, the bottom right, it says blog, weekly blog. On Monday, I'll do a blog on where we're at in our weekly reading. Like we're working our way through the first half of the New Testament. Next year will be the second half. But I just put a few thoughts down there, a couple hundred words, and you can comment. We can interact. Uh, if you want to get that a direct feed into your email, just contact us at the office. We can give you instructions how to do that. But it's just stuff that I just feel like, I don't know, I just feel like there's something inside of me. It's like coming out, I just have to do this. And I, I really don't know, you know, how far or how long this is going to go on. I don't know if I'm just going to keep doing it. I, uh, uh, you know, I may do another. I, I've got three others that I'm working on right now, and then when they're done, I don't know, I'll see if I have some more. But this really, really has been an adventure, and uh, I... All I can tell you is this stuff, I, it just flowed out of me. I mean, it's crazy. I wrote six of these in, in less than six months. You know, it's just like, wow, man. But I hope they're a blessing to you. I, I, I know they're a blessing to me. I, they really have spoken in my life. So just in summary, so where does that leave me? 40 years of serving Jesus. 40 years. You know, it's like, it's a little bit overwhelming. But um, what, what does the Bible say about predicting the future? Well, I'm going to close with this scripture. So if you would, turn to James James gives a warning about saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, he just says, you know, you don't know the future. You can have your dreams and your ideas, but you have to put your life in God's hands. And in James uh, chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, he says, Whereas you do not know what will happen, or well, actually back up a little, verse, uh, verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I mean, I'm thinking 40 years, it's like a vapor. You just blink your eyes like, wow, man, where did it go? I'm just so grateful that God has kept me, that I've been able to be used by God. But it says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this and do that. So I, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. My life is just a vapor. It will vanish away. I have dreams. I want to continue. I, I, I'm going to try and write as many of these book or booklets that I can until I feel like I'm done with those. I'm going to keep putting them on Amazon and getting them out there. Um, I'm 59, turning 60. I, I would like to continue pastoring this church for another eight or nine, maybe 10 more years. Somewhere around the, my late 60s, we're going to have to transition as a church and start bringing in a new senior pastor. Uh, but but I'm, I'm going to try and stay on, if I can, as a part-time pastor till I'm 74. The reason I need to stay on till I'm 74 is because then I will have been pastoring this church for 50 years. And I just think that's the coolest thing, man, you know. <laughs> 50 years. Like the same church, the same faces, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's the only church I ever pastored, and it's the only church I ever want to pastor. But I, I'm still fired up, man. I'm so excited about what's going on. There's just great stuff happening. I'm excited about our student ministry, watching what God's doing there. I'm excited about our free clinics, watching the people come in that we're able to serve. I'm excited about our, our pregnancy center that we're going to be starting and hopefully get that kicked off, uh, you know, January of next year. Uh, I'm excited about our small group, seeing people starting to connect. You know, there's just great stuff. Excited about the new people coming to our church and getting to know you and watching God work in your life but I, I just think there's more for us and there's definitely more for me I, I, I'm just going to take one day at a time but I, I'm going to put it in God's hands I'm looking forward to it uh, I, I, I'll just finish with this I'll say dedicating your life to God is the absolute best thing you can ever do and, and the God that we serve is truly an awesome God he'll never let you down let's close in prayer God, I thank you that you are interested in every one of our lives, God. Every one of our lives. You, you care about us. 
You know our situation. You know where we're at today spiritually. Your, your grace and your mercy is always available. And your ability to keep us, God, is even more incredible. I'm just so grateful, God, for the journey that you've brought me on and the journey uh, all this church and the people who've been a part of it, God, and watching you change people's lives, God. You, you've given us a purpose and a plan, and we are grateful, God. I pray, Father, that we would live radically devoted, 100% sold out for you, God. It's, it's the best way to live. I just challenge you here today. If there's, if there's some of you today that are sitting on the fence... You know, maybe there's even some of you here today that were in a situation just like I was. Maybe you're thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church and I'm trying to be good and earn my way to heaven. But is it possible the Holy Spirit's talking to you this morning and knocking at the door of your heart? Saying, hey, I'd, I'd like to really come into your life. Let you know what it really means to be a Christian. Give you an understanding of a life that I created for you. Let's just take a moment. Let's let the Holy Spirit move here. Father, we just welcome your presence here right now. Holy Spirit, just move among us and touch hearts, call people. And maybe there's some of you that have opened the door of your heart, but even this morning, you, you, know, you haven't really gone 100%. If it's 50% or 70%, but this morning you're hearing the Holy Spirit say, come on, come on, 100%. Put it all down. Surrender. Trust Him. You know, if you're sensing that stirring in your spirit or you're hearing the Holy Spirit knocking at the door of your heart, I'd like to just challenge you in a minute. Would you just make a decision this morning and say yes to that? And, and if you would... In a minute, I'll just ask you to raise your hand right where you're at. I'm just going to pray for you right there and even pray that simple prayer that I prayed. Give God an opportunity to come into your life and, and allow Him to do the work that only He can do. It's a supernatural event, something only you and God can work out. No one else can do this for you. Mom and dad can't. Spouse can't. This is your time. Where are you at? Where are you at spiritually? Just come, Holy Spirit. Just welcome your presence, Father. Anybody sensing that stirring in their spirit this morning? You want to make a decision? Would you just do me a favor? Raise your hand right where you're at. I want to open my heart up. All the way in the back. Give that hand all the way in the back there. Up here. Hand right up here. Okay. All right. Others? raising your hand just saying yes I, I want to make a decision this morning just hold your hand up. I'm going to pray for you right where you're at opening your heart up I'm going to cross the line go 100% I want God in my life no holding back right here all the way up right up front here come on I'm knocking at the door of your heart are you going to open it just come Holy Spirit welcome me Father Thank you, God, you can change lives here this morning. Some of you are discouraged. The Holy Spirit's calling you, man. The Holy Spirit's calling you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Okay, so three of you have raised your hand. Let, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's just pray this prayer together, the whole church. And then after the service, those three of you that raised your hand, if you'd do me a favor, come up front here. We'd love to talk with you. Uh, and just get a chance to maybe help you in this decision, become a part of your family, and you become part of ours. We can encourage you. But let's pray this prayer. Jesus, please come into my life and forgive me of all of my sins. I surrender my life to you. I call you my Lord and my Savior. Spirit's coming into your heart. Some of you got some darkness in there. The Holy Spirit of God is shining light on it, driving it out right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Bless your name. 
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand? We're going to take our offering at this time. For us to come forward. We have our prayer team up front here. Let's get ready to close in prayer. You know, a couple things. Just uh, one thing just kind of dropped into my spirit as I was just worshiping. I asked earlier during the sermon how many of you uh, like felt like you'd like to write a book. And I just really felt like... Um, so what I'm going to do, like, I'll get it scheduled in a couple of weeks. We're going to have a meeting here, like, on a Sunday night. Any of you that want to write a book, we'll meet together, and I'll walk you through the steps. And I think it would be awesome to have so many of you write books, and we could just sell them here and just really have a great experience at putting out some of the wisdom God has given you. So uh, I just felt like the Spirit of God just said, you know what, let's push this a little bit. So start thinking about it. I'll get something scheduled in a couple of weeks. We'll have a meeting here, and I'll just walk you through. Uh, you'll be amazed really do this. It's really kind of amazing. A couple of other uh, words of knowledge just came into my spirit. I just got to send somebody's dealing with some swelling in their hands. I don't know what's going on there, but you're just retaining water or something. So if I'm speaking to you, the Spirit of God points these things out sometimes just to kind of bring some faith and some healing there. Also, somebody dealing with an infection that just is not healing. And uh, you're concerned about it. And if that's you, we want to pray for you this morning. We just want to pray for you if you have other needs. If you're dealing with sickness dealing with situations in your home, financial, relationships. This is always a good chance. You just give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak directly into your life. We believe in the ministry and the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. So after the service, we invite you forward. Also, just today, just for fun, if you uh, want to buy a book and you want me to, you know, sign it for you, like an autograph thing, you know. <laughs> you know, it just sounds funny, man, but, you know. I know when I buy books of the authors there, I want them to sign it to you. So anyway, look, I'll be in the back there if you want. I'll sign it for you just for fun. But uh, appreciate all of you. So grateful and honored to be a pastor of this church. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you for bringing us together today. And uh, we just pray that uh, you send us out this week and just help us be mindful of the fact that you are a part of our lives, God. We love you. We want to serve you. Be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, just one last thing I forgot to tell you. We do have credit card. You can buy by credit card this morning over the cafe. So, and cash and checks, all that kind of stuff. God bless you. All dismissed.